Um, I know a lot of you are new. This this uh, space is fuller every time I come back. I try to get back once a year, and I just I'm preaching to the choir here. But I want you new folks to know you have found a great place. This is this is a church just full of warm, wonderful people who love Jesus, and it is a pastoral team that um, they love the church because it's Christ church. And I got to spend uh, last evening before Dave got sick with uh, all the pastors and, and their wives and hearing from them what they're excited about in the church. And, and uh, it, they love you and they love what God's doing here. And, and so do I from all those miles away in Minneapolis because of my friendship with these guys. I feel like we're part of it because we're in it together. Like, like Dave said, we, we, we are partners in the gospel. D- Dave York, I know you know that. Uh, um, D- Dave mentioned him going to the Philippines. That's huge. Sovereign Grace has, uh, there's a lot of interest in the Philippines. And it, we're going to have a Philippine region of Sovereign Grace, Lord willing, pretty soon. And Dave's part of that. Um, he's also the chair of our church planting committee. I- I've mentioned that before, but as part of that, he got trained to be a church planting coach. And he coaches a church planter named Sean Powers, who was on staff with me for five years, who we just sent out to plant a church in Des Moines. So, so Dave's got a part in this church plant from our church in Des Moines. So we're, we're in this thing together, and it, it, it is a, a delight. But what I, what I wanted to say about all that, Dave's got the extra local stuff going on. What's so clear is that the local church is the most important to Dave. And, uh, and that, that's really, that, that's a value in, in Sovereign Grace. Yes, we're in partnership together. Yes, we're, some of us like Dave are flying across the ocean, but we exist to, to care for and to build and to plant local churches. So the local church is always the priority for your pastor. So I'll stop because I could go on and on. But new folks, stay because th- this is a great place to be. And I'm excited to continue worshiping with you as we look into God's Word. So will you open your Bibles to Psalm 100? If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, that's okay. I'm pretty sure it's all going to be. Yeah, there it is. It's projected up there. This morning, we're going to consider... Um, The fact that we gather, just like we're doing here, every Sunday we gather together to respond. That is, to respond to God, to who He is in His magnificence and His glory, and to respond to what He's done for us, His people, as an expression of that glory. So what we're talking about this morning is worship because worship is a, a response here's here's my best attempt to define worship worship is our our right or our appropriate response to the glory of god seen in jesus christ through the holy spirit that's worship we respond to who god is made clear to us in Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this psalm has a lot to say uh, about our response to God as his church. So let's read, I'll pray, and uh, we'll dig into Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving, and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him, bless His name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and His faithfulness to all generations. Let's pray. Father, we are, we are so grateful for your presence with us. Here we are. Here we are. Your church in your presence, in your gates, in your courts, and we're here at your invitation. And that's amazing. 
And I, I, I just pray that you would empower the preaching so that we would be amazed afresh this morning at the grace of your invitation to come and enter in. Let it, let it fill our hearts with gratitude and praise. So spend, send your spirit now to, to fill us. Let's pray for a, a, a fresh infilling of your spirit corporately. And, and Holy Spirit, illumine your word to us and, and, and work in us to receive from us the response that the words of this psalm demand. And we ask it for our good and for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I love the psalm. I'm sure many of you do too. I have a history with this psalm. These um, five verses are the first verses of the Bible that I ever committed to memory. I was five years old. I was in kindergarten at Midwest Christian Academy on the near north side of Chicago only because the Catholic school in our neighborhood didn't have a kindergarten. But a nun told my mom that it would be okay to send me to that school. And at that school, I had to memorize Psalm 100. And my mom had to borrow a Bible in order to help me memorize it. And my grandma was so impressed at my recitation of Psalm 100 that she recorded it on a cassette tape. Now, some of you don't know what a cassette tape is. But you just have to trust me, it's an ancient means of recording. And though there are not many devices these days that play cassette tapes, I have heard it, which is how I know it's the first portion of Scripture I ever memorized. So here I am now, 46 years later, and this is the first and only sermon I've ever preached on that portion of Scripture that I first memorized. And I don't know what took so long. Because th this is a wonderful song. I mean, we just love the Psalms in general, don't we? We love them because they, they capture uh, the experiences of life in a remarkable way. And they, they help us give emotional expression to our experiences. And, and the Psalms not only uh, capture, uh, help us capture and, and express emotion as we walk through this life, the Psalms also shape our emotions. Psalm 100 was written to shape our emotions because, like in all the Psalms, in these five verses, we encounter the God of the universe. And when we encounter the God of the universe, like the psalmist, we respond. And, and this Psalm has a lot to say about the appropriate way to respond. And so... This ancient hymn book, all 150 psalms, and this song in particular, it's for us. It's for God's church. And, and I, why I say this psalm is for us in particular is because it's a hymn of praise. And it was sung by the people of God as they gathered and entered the temple in Jerusalem. That's why all the pronouns are, are Plural. This is a song to be sung when God's people gather together. And the structure of this psalm of praise is, is typical. You're going to find the same pattern or something similar to it in, in other praise psalms. Here's the structure. I'm sure you got it as I read it. The first stanza, it's called to worship. The second stanza is the cause of our worship, the reason why we ought to worship. Then the third stanza is a call to worship. And the fourth stanza is more causes of worship, more reasons why we ought to worship. So we're going to start by simply considering those two aspects of the psalm, the call to worship and the cause of worship. So let's begin where the psalmist begins with the call to worship. And it's, it's clear when you read the psalm, is it not that uh, th this is most definitely not a casual suggestion about how we might consider worshiping the Lord. There are no suggestions here. These are imperatives or commands, and they come flying at us, don't, don't they? They're just the rapid fire. 
In, in the three verses that contain the call to worship, verses 1, 2, and 4, there are seven commands, right? Make a joyful noise. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Enter His gates. Praise Him. Give thanks. Bless His name. So rapid-fire commands, not suggestions. Make a joyful noise. I mean, we... We don't tend to enjoy noise, do we? But, but this, this isn't just any background noise. This is a call to direct happy shouts of praise to the Lord. It's directional. It's to Yahweh. This is how God's covenant people enter the worship service. With shouts of acclamation. They're like, hail to the King. Long live the King. All honor to the King. That's how we come. And, and there's, no, there's no ambiguity here, is there? The worship, the response is to be enthusiastic. The, the gathering of God's people is not to be tepid. It's not the bland leading the bland. It's not lukewarm. It's to be passionate. It's to be loud. It's to be happy. And... It's ambitious. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Our happy worship of our happy God as we gather as the church on Sundays is missional. It, it has a, a missional component. So yes, we, we leave here. In just, just a few minutes, we'll leave here to go tell folks the glorious gospel. But we'll also invite folks to come see the effects of the glorious gospel that are all over His church. We invite people who, who don't believe to come to church. And yeah, for some of them, it's going to seem a little weird because we are weird. But for some, it will be compelling. And... They'll ask, where does the joy come from? What are these people so happy about? And then they'll hear, as the gospel is preached, what makes us so happy, and perhaps they'll join us. And that's just verse 1. Look at verse 2. Serve the Lord with gladness. That is, gather as happy slaves of the King. That, that's who we are this morning. We are glad slaves. Glad because there is no freedom, there is no joy like being enslaved to our happy God. He, he demands all of us, by which I mean all from us. And in return, we get the joy. We get the gladness. So we gather as happy slaves. Now, this phrasing also widens out our, our worship, right? Worship is not merely what we do here on Sundays. It, it, it's not less than what we do here on Sundays, um, but it is, it is more, right? We are to serve the Lord in all we do, which means worship is a way of life. It, it, it's, a, it's a happy disposition of a life surrendered completely to God. It's the glad realization every day that God has all of me. And we come into His presence with singing. I mean, that, that's a sermon in and of itself. Why do we sing? In fact, I've, I've preached a sermon on why we sing. Into verse 2. The way we enter into God's presence is prescribed for us. We enter with glad singing. I mean, Christians sing a lot. And, and it is kind of weird. I mean, we get together each week and sing for about a half an hour. Who else does that? I mean, the last time that I remember singing with a group of people that wasn't the church was singing the national anthem at a baseball game. And that lasted a, a couple minutes. But we gather and we give a lot of time to singing. Why do we do that? Because we're commanded to do that. And we're commanded to do that because sometimes talking, even joyful shouting, is not enough to express what we feel. So we sing. 
And we sing songs of thanksgiving and gratitude. Verse 4, twice the psalmist says it, Enter his gates with thanksgiving, give thanks to him. Now, this doesn't mean that we never come to church and, and pour out our hearts to God. right? The psalmist sometimes laments. When you read through the psalms, there's lots of psalms of lament. How long, O Lord? But there's a difference between that, a humble lament and prideful, selfish grumbling and complaining that flows from a sense of entitlement. We're not going to enter into God's presence with thanksgiving if we think we deserve to be there or deserve anything for that matter. That, that we've somehow earned the right to be treated better than our circumstance, our current circumstances, right? Gratitude flows from a heart that recognizes that we are absolutely unworthy to come into God's presence, and yet we can come. We can enter the gates at His invitation, and that's amazing. I mean, we deserve nothing. We do nothing to earn anything good. And yet everything we have, everything we are, every good thing we experience is the expression of God's pure grace, His undeserved favor, which should ignite our gratitude. And we enter His courts with praise and we bless His name. That is, we give Him honor. We give Him the honor due His name. So worship is a verb, right? Worship is something we do it's not something we gather to watch. I don't know, I don't know about this area, but in my area, in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, there's a lot of that going on in churches. I've experienced it in vacation Sundays, visiting churches. Lights overhead, dimmed, so you can't really see one another to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to one another. Spotlights on the band. The entire congregation is standing there, typically one hand in the pocket, the other with a Starbucks, and just watching the show. But worship isn't something we attend like a concert. Worship is something we enter into with all our might. That's why this psalm and all the psalms are filled with verbs. Shout, sing, dance, Clap, bow down, lift your hands, stand in awe, rock on. That's my paraphrase of Psalm 149.3. <laughs> Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. Rock on. Now, notice, the joyful shouts, the glad service, the happy singing, the gratitude, the praise, the blessing, none of it is tied to our circumstances. We're not told, make a joyful noise to the Lord if everything is going well with you. Sing a happy song to God if everything went just as you planned this week. Offer thanksgiving and praise and blessing to Him if you found out that there's going to be a really nice tax return this year. The, the imperative, these commands, are not tied to our situation or our circumstance. No matter how it's going with us, no matter what you're facing this morning, the Bible says, shout for joy, serve with gladness, make melody, give thanks. Now, notice this. The commands are not tied to personality or background or our personal preference. Right, The psalmist does not say, make a joyful noise to the Lord if you're wired that way. Give enthusiastic thanksgiving if you come from a church tradition where exuberant gratitude was encouraged. Sing happily if the song is being sung in the musical style you prefer. So when it comes to the worship of God, personality is not our guide. Background is not our guide. Personal preference is not our guide. God is our guide. And he speaks to us this morning through the psalmist and says, 
no matter your circumstances, no matter the way you're wired, no matter your background, no matter your church tradition, no matter your personal preferences, worship me with passionate, exuberant, melodic, loud joy. Now, we have to ask, why all the racket? Why shouts of joy? Why glad service? Why happy singing? Why gratitude and praise? The psalmist is not encouraging us to just put on a show. Right? Gather with the people of God and do what you can do to appear joyful. That's not what's going on here. These are not commands to be disingenuous. The psalmist, more importantly God, expects us to experience real, genuine joy as we shout and serve and sing and enter and thank and praise. And so verses 3 and 5 tell us why we ought to be joyful. And we need all the help we can get, don't we? I mean, I don't know about you, but if you're anything like me, and I do know about you, and unfortunately for you, you are like me. We're humans, and so we're fickle, right? We're distracted. Our joy wanes and seemingly disappears at times. And yet Psalm 100 is always in our Bibles. These commands never change. How, how can I be joyful today? when my circumstances are so dark. And tell me, what is it that ignites and sustains the joy? Here's the answer. God. Who God is. What He's done for His people. That's the source of our joy. So we need to get to know God. And we need to continue to grow in our knowledge of Him. And so we have another command Another verb in verse 3, know. Know God. The call to worship in Psalm 100 is not a call to be inauthentic. It's not a call to emotionalism, just the emotion for emotion's sake. It, 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 the, the call to joyful worship is based on what we know to be true about God. We know God in order to have affections for God. We see God in order to savor God. We think in order to feel. God reveals Himself and we react. He discloses, we respond. Knowing God is the prerequisite for praise. Worship is, is not about the stimulation of our emotions by music or by meditation, silence, whatever. Music is a vehicle for express, expressing our emotions, but those emotions are triggered by content, right? What, what this book says about the God of the universe. And then we express the emotions with joyful noise and serving and singing and thanksgiving. So the psalmist tells us truth about God. Know, verse 3, know that Yahweh is God. By which the psalmist means He is the only God. And so He's not a God to approach in any way we please. He's a specific God. The God described here on the pages between these covers. He's not the God we envision. He is the God He reveals Himself to be. Content matters because He is the one true God. Because there is no other God beside Him. Because He's absolute over all powers and all authorities in the universe. And this God made us. He's the Creator. right? He's the Creator of everything that exists. I mean, think about it. He spoke, and our sun came into existence. 93 million miles away, and at the right time of year, without sunscreen, it can fry a person to a crisp. 10,000 degrees on the surface. 
27 million degrees at its core. That's hot. And it's big, 870,000 miles wide. That's 109 times wider than the Earth, which means 1.3 million Earths could fit into our sun. That's big, and it's bright. I mean, stare at the sun with the naked eye, and it'll blind you from 93 million miles away. And our sun is just a medium-sized star. In fact, in our galaxy, there is a star that is 325 times larger than our star. 10 million times more powerful. So that it emits uh, as much energy in six minutes as our sun does in one year. And there are 400 billion stars in our galaxy. 170 billion galaxies, each with billions of stars. More stars in the universe than grains of sand on the earth, and God made it all. But what the psalmist highlights in this psalm is that God made us. He made you. He made all those stars and all those galaxies. But he says to you this morning, daughter, son, I made you. You are mine. And you are more precious to me than any star. <sighs> That's amazing. I mean, we are specks of dust in the universe. But God created us. And He owns us, which is wonderfully humbling. There is no such thing as a self-made man or a self-made woman. We are not our own. We are dependent on God for our very existence. Everyone on this planet is a product of God. And there are those who are His people, His sheep, into verse 3. We're not merely His property, we're His prized possession. And He cares for us like a shepherd cares for the sheep, which means He leads us to green pastures and besides still waters. He restores us and guides us. His rod and His staff comfort and protect us. And He provides all our needs and He pursues us with mercy every day. In verse 5, He's good. This is why His authority and power are, are good news and not terrifying news. He's not a tyrant. Our God is a good God. He's always good. In every way good. Infinitely good. He is the giver of all good gifts. It, it is His all-encompassing quality so that all things work together for good for His people, the sheep of His pasture. All things. Even when we don't understand how good could possibly come from it, good will come from it. It's true. He's good, and so all things work together for good. And God loves us. Middle of verse 5, He loves His people. He loves His sheep. And His love is steadfast and eternal. It's a loyal love. It's an unending love. It's an inexhaustible love. It's always been. God has always loved you, and He will never stop loving you. God never puts His love for you on pause. And His love will always be forever. Because, in verse 5, He's faithful. He's reliable. He's dependable. He will not ultimately let us down. He will never ultimately disappoint. Now, consider your situation today, your circumstances, your challenges. Maybe they're financial Maybe they're relational, maybe vocational, maybe physical. And then think of this God. Know this God, the God. The one with absolute power and authority. The one who made you and made you His. Which means that underneath whatever we face today, however hard, however sad, however tempting, underneath it, is something more real, more permanent, something that will outlast any challenge, something that will not be diminished by anything. God's goodness. God's steadfast love. God's faithfulness, which is all ours forever. 
no matter what we face today. No matter what we face today, our best days are yet to come. And those days will last forever. And that's a reason for a shout of joy. That's reason to serve with gladness and sing and thank and praise and bless. Now, let me show you that this is not just an Old Testament thing. Uh, it, it's not merely about the structure of a psalm. It's about what worship is. And to do that, I'm, I'm, I'm going to head over to the Gospel of John chapter 4. I'm going to highlight just two verses, 23 and 24. But let me set the context by reminding you of the very familiar story of Jesus and the woman at the well. Jesus and his disciples are, are traveling north to Galilee, and to get there, they have to travel through Samaria. And that's the land of the half-breeds. Right, Jews who hundreds of years before had intermarried with foreigners, and they didn't like each other much. In, in fact, the Samaritans built their own place of worship. They didn't go down to the temple in Jerusalem to worship. So Jesus sends his disciples into town, for supplies, and weary from his travels, he sits down at a well. And a Samaritan woman comes to draw water. And Jesus asks for a drink. And the woman is astounded that not only is a Jew addressing a Samaritan, but a man is speaking to a woman. But Jesus came to tear down dividing walls, put an end to racism and sexism and hatred and prejudice. And he responds to her astonishment by saying to her, if you knew the gift of God who asked you for a drink, you would ask him for a drink and he would give you living water. See, Jesus is telling her who he is and she can't see it yet. So, so he speaks again and says, everyone who drinks from this well will get thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give will never be thirsty again. The water I give will become a spring welling up to eternal life. So Jesus is saying to her, I am the fountain of life. I am the living water. Only I can satisfy you. He's telling her the most important thing she can ever know, that Jesus is the truly satisfying treasure of the universe. And she doesn't get it. There's something in the way. It's an idol. It's false worship. And so Jesus goes after what this woman is going after in order to get satisfaction Instead of going to God, he says, go get your husband. And she tells Jesus she doesn't have a husband. And Jesus says, you're right. You've had five husbands, and the man you're with now is not your husband. So J Jesus is saying to her that she cannot understand what he's offering her because she's drinking from broken cisterns that can hold no water. She's seeking satisfaction in earthly relationships with men, which is leading to multiple marriages and infidelity and promiscuity. But Jesus is after worship here. He's on the hunt to create a worshiper of God. So he, he's, he's there to help this promiscuous woman fulfill the very purpose for which she was created. And when he touches on her idol, a dim light goes on. And she says... I perceive that you're a prophet. Now, Jesus is hitting uncomfortably close to home now. And what the woman does next seems like a desperate attempt to change the subject. But Jesus is sovereign over the conversation, and it goes exactly where he intends it to go. In response to this prophet, this stranger telling her all about her life, she says, Our fathers worship on this mountain, but you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place to worship. Where did that come from? I mean, we, we go from divorce to fornication to worship. A worship controversy. And Jesus seizes the moment and says, A time is coming when there won't be worship on this mountain, nor in Jerusalem. Right? Jesus, he's saying that where people worship is not what's most important. Worship is, is not just some localized outward ritual that requires a building and priests and a sacrificial system. So what is it? 
Well, finally, verses 23 and 24. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. So true worship is in spirit and in truth. Now, what in the world does this have to do with Psalm 100? Well, the spirit here compares with the call of worship in the psalm. And the truth here compares to those causes of worship. Nothing has changed. True worship today is based on truth. A true perception of who God is and what He's done. Worship is all about God, about His greatness, about His nature, about His actions, about His desires, about His presence. That's why we put such a high premium on truth in our denomination, Sovereign Grace Churches. That's why your pastors lead you the way they do. That, that, that's why this morning we didn't merely sing uh, catchy worship songs that, that get a lot of airplay. We sang songs that express true content about God, that reflect the revelation of God that he gives us right here in this book. It's why Dave preaches the way he does here. You don't need to hear what Dave thinks about things. You don't need to hear Dave's opinion about things. You need to hear God's truth contained right here. And when we get the truth right, we'll get the spirit right. Just truth, just singing truth, just reading truth, just thinking about truth, that's not worship. The truth that God reveals requires a response from us. A response to God that is in spirit. Now Jesus is not talking about the Holy Spirit here. It's why it's not capitalized in your version. Though the Holy Spirit certainly has a role to play in our worship. That's a whole different sermon. But he's talking about our spirit. The point Jesus is making is that worship is mainly inward and spiritual. So formalism, traditionalism, they're inadequate. God requires more. He requires the heart. He requires the soul's worship. In Matthew 15, 8 through 9, Jesus says, He's quoting Isaiah here, Isaiah 29, 13. He says, This people honors me with their lips. They sing, they pray, they know what to say, but their heart, their emotions, their affections, far from me. And here's what that means. In vain do they worship me. Worship is an affair of the heart. It's vain or worthless or empty if it doesn't come from the heart. Truth about God ignites feelings for God that are then expressed as we worship. Expressed in singing, clapping, shouting, dancing, bowing, kneeling, weeping. And and our, our feelings ought to run deeper than even the psalmist. Because God's revelation of the truth about himself is even brighter in Jesus. We see God's glory more clearly in Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Right? Psalm 100 is realized completely in Christ. It's all the more vivid for us than it was for the psalmist. Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection finishes Psalm 100. If you think about it, we come into God's presence, right? With confidence, we draw near to the throne of grace, Hebrews 14, 16, because Jesus lived a perfect life on our behalf. And he wrapped us up in his righteousness, fireproof robes of his righteousness, so that we're not consumed by our God, who is a consuming fire when we get close. We don't have to work our way into His presence. It doesn't take the first couple worship songs to get into His presence. We're there. We're there all the time in God's presence because of Jesus. And we are His people, His sheep. 
And Jesus, who is the great shepherd, lays down his life for his sheep, John 10, 11. And so he takes away the sin and smashes all the barriers so that we are no mere sheep. We are God's adopted children, formed into one body, one family through our brother Jesus, Ephesians 1, 5. And we're his. We're not our own. Jesus bought us with a price, and the price was his life, 1 Corinthians 6.20. So we're doubly owned. We're, we were created by God, and we were bought by God. And to be God's possession is to be a recipient of his goodness and his love and his faithfulness. And all the good, his good, his love, and his faithfulness, they're most clearly seen in the cross. While we were weak, Christ died for us, the ungodly, to show God's loving kindness that saves those who sin against him. Romans 5, 6 through 8. Christ is, he's the constant and compelling and consummate and climactic reason we worship, like Psalm 100 says to. I mean, we ought to be the happiest people on the planet. Jesus is, lived and died and rose again for us. We are his children. We are co-heirs of everything with our brother Jesus. And so God never stops doing good to us. His goodness, his love, his faithfulness are our destiny. When we worship, according to Psalm 100, we say to God, and we say to one another, and we say to the world that, that our love for him And our happiness in Him transcends everything in this life that makes us unhappy. We gather to remind one another of what's true and to respond to that truth together. We come every Sunday. Come every Sunday. Some of us from draining jobs. Some of us come with deteriorating bodies. Some of us come with that defiant child on your mind. Some come with depleted funds. Some come who are in disappointing marriages, but we come, right? We gather to remember and to respond to the fact that we still have Jesus and he still has us. And that's reason for joy, even when life is sad. I mean, today we have seven days worth of grace from Jesus that we didn't have last week. Today we are seven days closer to fullness of joy in God's presence forever when Jesus comes back. That's worth a shout. And that's something to sing about. That's a reason to be grateful. We don't always feel joyful. This gathering is not designed to manipulate or coerce anyone. It's a place to come and authentically respond to what's true about God. If if you're a Christian, you can sing because of what you know to be true, even if you're not feeling it, even if you don't feel like it. In fact, you can sing until you do feel it. Or you can just listen to others sing until you feel it. I mean, we ought to be eager to gather to respond no matter how we feel on Sunday morning when we roll out of bed. This is where we come to hear truth, adjust our emotions so that they conform to what's true. This is where we gather to respond. Let's pray. So Father, will you help us do that even right now uh, during this last song if we haven't felt a thing all morning let 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 truth now ignite an emotional response from us the the response that you intend and give us the grace to express it with joy and gladness and enthusiasm and passion. You are worthy of our expressive worship. So be glorified now in Jesus' name.